people in ladakh are much more patriotic than i see people in new delhi we always thought that social media was a liberating force a democratizing force but today we see that regimes can even throttle this kind of voice you no know, we often just copy the west and think this is development this is attention this is care if that's the case i am happier without definition of school should change what is the one thing that you notice that ladakh has but other cities don't fresh air but what you just described right now does not sound like a democracy it sounds like a dictatorship it is not a <laughs> democracy at all if ladakh is a desert then why does china want ladakh what interest does it have in ladakh the apricot market in india is worth many thousand crores for ladakh it will be a game changer a lot has been spoken about yeti but i feel there is a real yeti in front of us that we can see that we can feel and that is harming our lives and that is climate change please live simply in the big cities so that we in the mountains simply live This is probably the most requested collab that we are doing finally after 5 years we finally have Sonam sir right here in our studio and this is such a fanboy moment for us because we've been following his work for a really really long time the one thing that we absolutely love about him is that he never stops at not having a solution to any problem if the solution does not exist he will invent a solution and that is the same sort of thinking that we would like to employ in our videos at least at least where we can try to come up with some sort of a solution so firstly sonam sir thank you so much for coming over here thank you so much for agreeing for this conversation and thank you so much for inspiring us to have this belief that there is a solution we just need to go out there and find it Thank you Abhi first of all for having me here and uh, I'm an admirer of your work and uh, both of you have done amazing work farak padta hai especially you uh, made that environmental video long ago about Ladakh's garbage problem and so on just to uh, think back and think about our association with Ladakh and with you it started from a really long time ago the pandemic had just started and you made a video about why we need to be atmanirbhar why we need to be more self reliant and why we need to stop our over reliance on china now i have a question for you whenever somebody talks against china there is a lot of backlash did you face any of the backlash yes there was a time when i had to go vocal because it was right in my backyard this is a democratic world a hmm. free world Correct. outside of the chinese boundaries Correct. we should be able to speak and um, mobilize the nation to become self reliant actually the world we are over dependent on a regime that is not democratic that treats its own people as badly or worse than the rest of the world so we must raise our voice so one thing that changed was a lot of awareness in people in india correct correct so directly no there was no such backlash directly but what we did see indirectly youtube was i think pressured into suppressing my channel hmm. so whether economically it had an influence or not i want to believe it had but uh, on my work yes it curtailed and suppressed the reach of my channel so today what would get a uh, few million would be few lakh what should be few lakh would be some tens of thousands of views okay and uh, first of all i didn't believe in it then i looked up and you can look up uh, on internet itself you know china suppressing youtube etc there are tons of channels who speak Okay. Uh, about I would say not even against about what China does, and they are all suppressed, and they are very vocal about how uh, this is happening. Okay. So that definitely has happened. We always thought that social media was a liberating force, a democratizing force, but today we see that regimes can even 
throttle this kind of voice Correct. so people should uh turn into soldiers of this voice and that's why i uh, through your channel i would like to draw their attention to uh, channels like mine which try and speak out about what's happening in our mountains where the chinese military keeps uh, bullying pushing for no reason really and our uh, shepherd who rear pashmina goats are losing their pastures you know not just uh, two or three years this has been happening for decades and in that process we have lost a lot of land and when you raise the voice uh, this is what happens i have this one question that if ladakh is a desert then why does china want ladakh what interest does it have in ladakh so the argument they would give is that tibet is a part of china now and uh, ladakh was at times in history hmm. part of tibet or had the same culture but that is no justification firstly it's illegally occupied tibet itself you know by a china from some mistake or event in history i mean if you go by such mistakes then india should belong to british because we were at some point british doesn't mean that there should be maybe referendum if at all to ask the people but china just forcefully occupied tibet and therefore now it claims any regions that has the same culture or same people like in arunachal or here but more than that i think until india becomes equally strong economically militarily hmm. it will keep doing that because it is also a way for them to punish india hmm. for how it behaves in the united nations and in other global uh, fora right so if india doesn't support or opposes china in some fora they'll punish by bullying here that the outcome of being not as strong so we every citizen of india should act like soldiers not leave the borders to the soldiers you make your factory run so well that your products will sell make them efficiently and economically so that we outsell yeah? hmm. if you're a doctor keep the health of your people so well that they are more productive if you are a teacher produce the best of students hmm. that's when the whole nation will rise and outpace china hmm. and that uh, then won't be a luxury we'll enjoy to just keep poking and bullying when it wants to punish india hmm. it's bullying speaking about different strategies that china employs there is something called as salami slicing mm -hmm. that uh, china employs that it keeps slicing a little bit of land every time who could know more than people exactly. in ladakh exactly so what is ladakh's perspective that have you seen any sort of a experience where uh, as you gave an example yeah yeah totally if you go to ladakh and ask the shepherds in the villages uh, where did your parents and grandparents graze their goat they'll show you know the uh, places way beyond where you can go oh wow so after 62 they had access uh, to a lot of places but now uh, over the last 70 60 years on or so uh, we have lost a lot of land so when ladakh is losing land india is also losing land and it's precious property for us of course of course ladakhi people are losing their bread and butter india is losing its uh, glory and its pride and its uh, self uh, determination correct so we have been hearing a lot that china keeps developing a lot of infrastructure on their side of the border do you think that we are also sort of uh, fighting with them in terms of infrastructure have you noticed that there has been any sort of infrastructure growth in the recent years say 10 years 15 years whatever yeah yeah there, there is a lot of uh, impetus right now from the government to strengthen and improve the villages on the border so there's a whole scheme that uh, does it and i'm very happy that the government is doing it but what i would like the government to do is uh, proactively rather than reactively the problem with us on the border in ladakh is we are almost always reactive 
we right. do after seeing what they do whether it is militarily or developmentally we don't do things that uh, china might emulate could you elaborate that what the government should do proactively to so that the ladakh, ladakh is prepared china was developing the borders uh, and helping the people around the borders although people in the on the tibetan side are not at all happy with that regime but they would make it so uh, materially at least uh, comfortable for them with infrastructure roads and so on on the other hand on the indian side it's very uh, neglected it has been very neglected because of which people from the region have been migrating to the cities in ladakh to the towns and therefore we are left with an empty border which is a very dangerous thing so there is now an initiative from the government to uh, populate the village and improve infrastructure but it is reactively done now there should be more proactive energy put into the region and um, you, for example strengthen their livelihood Uh, that are traditional there you know we have had pashmina goat yak we need to improve that uh, livelihood in big ways uh, and uh, make life easy for them in every way you know schools there are some schools but they don't care about the local culture local realities it's a copy of what happens in leh which is a copy of what happens in new delhi Okay so we need to address to the local people's needs where uh, raising goats and yak is celebrated hmm. they are often made to feel you know small for doing that i always had a question that whenever i when i had been to ladakh that was around 4 or 5 years ago i felt that the people of people of ladakh are very patriotic mm-hmm. do you think that people of ladakh are very patriotic and if so why why are they so patriotic no nation should have to ask why its people are patriotic Correct. we should all be but yes i totally believe that unfortunately in india people in ladakh are much more patriotic than i see people in new delhi so people in ladakh have always been they look up to india as a source of uh, culture civilization buddhism so always ladakh has had a very um, respectful view including tibet but speaking of imbalance do you feel that overall ladakh and the people of ladakh are somewhat neglected i wouldn't say neglected in general because one way of paying attention is just throwing money and bringing all kinds of things in the name of development actually i appreciate it more when these things don't reach a place mm-hmm. so neglected mm, yes materially maybe because of its remoteness the reverse of that wouldn't be throwing money and uh, big inappropriate infrastructure the opposite of that our care would be to let the people decide how they want these mountains to be rather than somebody in new delhi deciding they should have concrete buildings and that's called development that's called care and attention so uh, people in ladakh should be left to decide how they would like their uh, villages their uh, shepherds their farmers develop there's a problem with india itself you know we often just copy ape i would say the west and think this is development this is attention this is care if that's the case i am happier without i would rather uh, like ladakh and maharashtra and assam and kashmir to develop with some kashmiriyat some punjabiyat some correct correct uh, maharashtriya ta yeah so we should have that diversity and celebrate in and proudly develop in our own ways while being a uh, proud indian right speaking of development a recent development that has happened in the last 15 years or so is the impact of three idiots on ladakh 
So when the movie Three Idiots came out, a lot of people got to know that there is this beautiful place in India called Ladakh, and they started visiting the exact same place at the exact same time. Do you think this has been a good development or a bad development or somewhere in the middle? What's your take on this? Mass tourism is not a good development. Okay. I would rather have people who want to know about Ladakh, learn about Ladakh, want to be. in the land like the people are rather than who just want to come for 3 days go to a place take a selfie leave their garbage and go back unfortunately that has happened more than the intercultural exchange kind of tourism so excess of anything is not so this kind of mass tourism i have problem with i would rather have traveler and explorer Yeah, interest it has generated, which is good, <laughs> but uh, it can be much better. Okay, uh, we were discussing just before this uh, conversation that uh, in the few months, four or five months of uh, summer, there are there is a huge influx of tourists in Ladakh, and later on there is nothing. There is nobody who is visiting Ladakh. So, do you think we can evenly distribute this? What would be a better strategy? Yes, exactly. so one of my missions to make ladakh environmentally sound and sustainable among various other things is to bring some sense and balance in tourism right now yeah 5 lakh tourists descend on 5 square kilometers of le city in 5 months so it's it's very um, strong dose concentrated dose to be good for the place and you have seen and made videos on how the garbage problem you called it ladakh is dying it actually is dying with that kind of concentrated dose so yeah that reminds me recently uh, i made a video urging tourists from indian cities to come in other seasons like winter like spring there's so much beauty in ladakh but unfortunately as i said earlier my videos are so curtailed that it got uh, views in thousands only whereas it's a message to the nation to help ladakh um, you know bring balance in this tourism so i would urge that they watch that and visit ladakh in not just the 5 months but around the year and not just le city but all over ladakh if we distribute tourism then it's a wonderful effect it brings income to the villagers it brings income to winter spring when hotels keep open using so much fuel and energy expecting tourists and they run on 10% occupancy which is such a waste for the environment so i would write like people to become travelers and explorers and visit okay uh What are three unique or different experiences that people can have if they don't come in summers? If they come in so-called off seasons that we want to make all season? So one unique by now experience is that they'll get to feel authentic Ladakh because what you see in summer is hardly Ladakh. We feel like we are in some other place. You know? Okay, you come there to see each other. <laughs> The whole of Mumbai comes, all of Bangalore comes, and there's very little you you have to look for uh, local people. But when you come in late autumn, winter, spring, you get to be a part of life of the people of Ladakh, and you get to experience uh, something unusual. You know, tourism is okay, but the spirit of travel is to experience things you don't get to experience in your own city. So. Minus thirty is an amazing experience, and now if you have facilities like hotels with plus twenty degrees rooms, then amazing. You, you correct. Cold is a choice. You know you can if you want go out. If not, be in the comfort of the room. But then you get to explore frozen lakes and uh, valleys and festivals. All the festivals of Ladakh, almost all, happen in winters. This nobody knows so i call winters the best kept secret of ladakh wow so uh, recently we had watched another video of yours 
where you uh, explored the cherry blossom festival mm. of Ladakh. Does that happen during spring time after the winter is over? Not cherry, apricot blossom. First, uh, there's winter now, yeah, February, right. January, which is colorful in its own ways. And I made this uh, video on the romance of winter in mm. Ladakh. Then comes spring by March, April. Yeah? So that's when the entire valley becomes all pink and you know, with uh, apricot blossoms all over. So that's mostly in April, but already March, April, May, uh, with April as the main month, people come from all the way from Japan and places to experience apricot blossom. I was just watching a video that you had published on your channel called Winters in Ladakh, where you uh, told us that people can actually learn how to ice skate in Ladakh. People can watch people playing ice hockey, which is very famous in Ladakh. Our ice hockey team is in, almost entirely from Ladakh. Ladakh yes. So people can see that. Plus Apricot Blossom Festival is something that you mentioned mm -hmm. in springtime. So Ladakh is not just unique during summertime. It's such a unique place throughout the year. And we should experience it throughout the year. But my question is, how does one reach Ladakh? Because I had heard in my limited knowledge that Ladakh is cut off from the world. Is it true? Yes, it is cut off... Um land roads. Okay. Yeah? So uh, roads are closed because of snow on the mm, passes. Okay. But air route remains always all in. And these days, most tourists anyway come by air, even in summer. So Ladakh is open all the time. Now, you can either just stay in Leh or few places like the Pangong Lake, Nubra, which is good. Um, but there are other places that are Ladakh like Kargil, it has many interesting places, uh, Zangskar or Cham Valley. During the European tourism time, which is before this film, yeah, when Europeans only used to come to Ladakh, they were not so much about a lake. They were more about the Lama Yuru Monastery, which is like in a setting that looks like moonscape, Marscape, uh, out of the world. Similarly, Zangskar was very popular among European tourists. So these are all there, ready to be discovered alongside the places that they go. So I would like some balance uh, in places. The next segment is called Three Things, where we will mention just three things. It's sort of a rapid fire, so we have to be quick about it. So what are the three things that India needs to do to improve its tourism? First. Okay. Uh, First is India needs to show true India and not Mumbai and Delhi and Bangalore, which are second-hand copies of their city. Got it. So Second. uh, for that, India should improve the infrastructure in these villages together with the people so that it is done in a way that uh, it reflects the local culture. Correct. Thirdly, uh, we need to promote tourism as a major source of income for rural areas because tourism not only brings revenue to hotels and homestays but it also becomes a market for their product so these have to be three things that india needs to do so that we can stop china's influence so one huh. first would be to match it uh, yeah on the borders uh, with the right attention and investment. Secondly, it's not just borders and the soldiers at the borders. Every citizens need to feel like soldiers and do their job so well that our economy is much bigger and a match to China's so that we can uh, make Correct. it. Thirdly, our companies and our professionals need to believe that we can uh, be a good alternative now that countries are leaving China. We need to be there to take the opportunity. If we just leave the country and go to Silicon Valley, we are not going to match. So we need to stay put and give the fight. Okay. I know that we were not going to talk about education, but as such an educator is in front of me, I have to ask this mm -hmm. question that three things we need to do to improve our education system. First thing I would say uh, drastically is that 
definition of school should change right schools should not be where you give lectures on concepts that can be done from internet Correct. youtube and ai can do <laughs> schools should become places of experimentation exploration teamwork collaboration to do real life application of what you heard as a lecture right right okay and then um we should make education as much as possible hands on applied not uh, just in textbooks and class so children should be encouraged if possible needed to show their um, you know application and relation with real world okay thirdly and very importantly we should decide which language we want to carry out education if it is mother tongue then all schools should do it in mother tongue hmm? city or uh, village it should be hindi where hindi is spoken tamil where tamil is spoken but mother tongue and if we decide no it should be in english then all schools in rural areas should get all the attention to develop that language we are in the worst of both the worlds so language of instruction or medium of it right one quick question uh, is there any particular problems that you have discovered because of language because there is no uniformity in language uh, do people find it difficult to learn in english or w- what is the scenario in ladakh or however in your experience in yeah. ladakh you can see i think language is the biggest challenge that india is facing if you see that we are not able to have as many you know good product uh-huh. or uh, good scientists or nobel laureate it has to do with language i hmm. in the ru- urban areas people may speak english but that's their second language so you will never be as good as the americans and the british it's not their thinking language yeah, they are translating in their minds they are yes and in the rural areas you speak your language but your education your examination everything is in another language so we are in the worst of both the worlds we need to choose all right coming back to three things this is the last question in three things that three things india needs to do to protect our environment educate every citizen to consider this as uh, like roti kapda makan and paryavaran it's like our home right right uh, that level of attention to uh, environment secondly in education half of it should be about environment no because now it's a question of survival of the entire human and uh, other species so we cannot keep education about science math technology that led us to this state correct correct it should be about healing okay so thirdly good regulation hmm. with wisdom at the government level so that they don't look at today's um, comfort and income rather look at you know 20 years 30 years so far sighted policies that protect say our himalayas for our next generation not just today and for industrial lobbies today. so long term uh, far sighted protective policy okay now moving on speaking about environment now you can give long answers mm-hmm. you had this movement in fact you have this movement called i live simply can you tell me that how an individual can incorporate being sustainable in their daily lives what mm-hmm. can people do to be more sustainable and moving more towards sustainability one thing that each one can do is understand that we are all connected globally today and our behavior affects the climate so right. uh living simpler lives with less of uh, material belongings mm-hmm. will help the environment and will help your pocket also you know why just to show off to your neighbors have uh, 30 pair of um, shirts and shoes and two houses or three cars or motorbikes and so on Correct. live simply as the indian ethos has been you know it's a western concept to possess material wealth 
in india we have always believed in being happy with less contentment so if we can show to the world that this is true india where simplicity is one of kind of godliness yeah um i think we'll have shown to the world a huge lesson from india correct you spoke about something quite interesting which is this show off culture mm. that people buy things not because they need them but because they want to impress somebody totally different mm. so do you think this is harming not just the environment but overall our outlook about life as well because there is always something new to look forward to you are never satisfied if you are talking about new clothes that piece of shirt is going to remain new only for one one day or one hour in fact one time you wash it and it will have it will be like an old cloth so do you think this whole idea of impressing somebody is harming us definitely it's a kind of insecurity that keeps us restless that keeps us poor i mean poor is not someone who doesn't have materials or money poor is can be someone who has a lot but needs more somebody can be rich with the minimal of uh, materials hmm. so it's a state of mind and therefore of all the people and civilizations of the world i would think india could teach the world and not be a victim of this mentality from the west india is one place where mahatma buddha 2500 years ago showed a lifestyle where he said for a human being it is a greater achievement to dissolve a desire uproot a desire than to fulfill 1000 desire okay unfortunately we are following the fulfilling and chasing desires that is mostly been the western um, concept okay so one thing i wanted to ask you is that whenever you travel outside of ladakh what is the one thing that you notice that ladakh has but other cities don't fresh air exactly <laughs> do you think all of our problems that uh, our problems related to health will just change if our air improves definitely i mean air pollution is a big killer i mean research says that roughly um 7 million people die just because of air pollution 2.5 million in india alone so you can imagine i mean lives are cut by 5 to 8 year in urban metropolitan wow. city so it's a violence we are killing people before their time comes so <laughs> yeah definitely and it lowers our efficiency our children their brain development is hampered yes fresh air so just mm. not having fresh air is also impacting india's future because the children who are growing right now they will not realize it right now but then they are cutting off 10 15 years of their lives just because of the air that we breathe this is such a tragedy uh does this all of this make you angry at some level that there is general apathy towards something that is so serious that we are committing a crime against humanity regardless of race religion gender income levels everything because everybody breathes the same air so does this anger you it does it kind of uh, make me question how and whether democracy work you know this is a country where people can influence policy makers government and yet this doesn't seem to be an issue we are more into divisions of you know regions religions caste and so on <laughs> that becomes the issue for choosing a government rather than uh, surviving you know we are dying in these gas chambers so a government with a will would put restrictions on how many cars a city can have beyond that what's the point when the cars can't move when they are slower than people walking right but they don't do it because nobody is rallying behind this issue government does what people want you know when people don't uh, shout they say even a mother doesn't milk feed a baby if the baby doesn't cry right so people don't make issues of the air quality and therefore government doesn't 
so it pleases the car companies and the factory owners because people are not making noises. If people make enough noise, then government will tell the industries that now I can't hold any longer. Look at the uproar among the people. I have to make policy. And they will, like Singapore does have. It's so expensive to buy a car. Not the car. The license to have a car is much more expensive than a car. Then those who want to pay that much better have free roads. Those who don't, you can use that money to make public transport not cheap, but actually free. Right. I would say make public transport completely free with the tax that you collect from those who desperately want to have right. cars and have the money. Charge them so much that public transport is free. So such policies need will on the part of the government and uh, support from the people to have that will. Will doesn't come free. Speaking of anger, there has been a lot of anger uh, in different groups of people. And in democracy, you, you raised a very important point that sometimes we question whether democracy works or whether it doesn't. And unless somebody raises their voice for what they truly believe in and what they truly want, nobody is going to listen. So what is it that you want right now? Or what is it that people of Ladakh want right now? that they are raising their voice for? Okay, these days, every Ladakh, almost every Ladakh, their minds are full with uh, safeguarding the Himalayas and the Ladakh part of the Himalayas. This is a very fragile ecosystem, which can support only few, you know, hundred thousands of people. It's really a desert, almost another planet. Right. So, People want to safeguard that region and luckily, very luckily, there is a provision in the Indian constitution called the Sixth Schedule of Article 244, which gives indigenous people in the mountains or hills the right to decide their own development progress. People of Ladakh expected when they became a union territory, for which they are ever grateful. Hmm. But they expected that while becoming a union territory, the mountains will be safeguarded from, say, mining, from, say, big chains of hotels or big migration of large populations, which it cannot support. And they, of course, made a representation to the government that uh, now we should get this uh, safeguard because we more than qualify. Normally it is considered like if a region has 50% uh, indigenous tribal population then it can. Ladakh has 97% indigenous tribal population. And the government on its part didn't say no. They had serious meetings in different ministries okay. saying Yes, we will safeguard Ladakh under the Sixth Schedule. Hmm. The government or the ruling party uh, made promises, not verbal. They made written promises in election manifestos where they kept this issue as the top three on their agenda. And based on that, people voted heavily and they formed government. But then after a year or two, suddenly things changed and they backed out and they are no longer keeping their promise. So okay. every Ladakh is, I would say, upset, if not angry, that how is it possible you make written promises and then it's like giving a written check and then you go to the bank and it says it's a uh, bounce. That's legally also <laughs> and ethically. But then it's very confusing that the people of Ladakh want it. The government knows that people of Ladakh want it and the government has agreed to provide for it as well. Then what do you think is the problem? Yes, it's a mystery. But my take is that in between, there were some industrial lobbies okay. that had big plans for the mountains of Ladakh, for mining, for industry and so on, big hotel chains, all kinds of. And they would not like it protected their interests would be hurt. Hmm. And they, together with some local leaders, 
made a case to the government that at no rate this place should be protected under yeah. such a strong constitutional provision i mean look at the beauty of indian constitution hmm. it not only tolerates diversity it actually encourages diversity by keeping provisions like the six schedule and you know when you have a right to something and you are promised we would be laughed at by the next generations for not encashing your check and when it bounces you kept ch- shut up yeah here yeah. so but uh, a lot of times i keep wondering that development and environment don't go hand in hand mm-hmm. they are right on the opposite ends of a spectrum so my question is is ladakh or the people of ladakh capable enough to support the development of ladakh keeping all these separate things in mind that there is geopolitical problems with china it's a bordering uh, union territory right now and soon to be state so uh, do you think the people of ladakh are capable by themselves without the interference of industries to develop ladakh i think only the people of ladakh are capable to think best about that region as people of maharashtra only would be capable of being the best interest of maharaj maharashtra others will come and exploit it hmm. but only maharashtrians will have a heart and would bleed when things go wrong here so each place should be given that liberty to develop and under the six schedule there is a provision that we are not saying that uh, ladakh should not be developed there should be no industry no if the people of ladakh so desire there can be industry so what the six schedule says is that there should be a council of the local people okay with the power to make legislation laws and then if they so desire they can bring the industries as much as they want right now what it is is that people of ladakh just don't matter one person the lieutenant governor can do whatever they like and the lieutenant governors can be very good can be very bad also and they come for just 3 years or so okay it doesn't matter if they make a mess they don't have to suffer the consequences it's the local people who will suffer the consequences so therefore all we are saying is let the locals decide as is enshrined in the constitution but what you just described right now does not sound like a democracy it sounds like a dictatorship totally it's it is not a <laughs> democracy at all there's no forum to decide on where to spend the money for example government speaks of 5000 crores and so on of that 90% is spent by one person's wishes desires whims whatever you call if that person is really good good things can happen but that was true of monarchy also so dictatorship also you have a benevolent dictator nothing like that but they are very rare so we are likely to have horror stories more likely so it is not a democracy in ladakh have no such uh, you know um, misconceptions misconceptions that ladakh is a democracy ladakh is not it has no representation except for one mp we used to have four members of legislative assembly that's gone there's nothing that people can say about where like 4000 crore rupees are spent yeah um it's actually not good for india also these uts without legislature yeah undemocratic uts are only with uh, small regions that were acquired from another country like the portuguese or the french then you make uh, such uts in a way we are saying that ladakh is a disputed uh, territory of another country then china is ready to say yeah it was my region you took it and that's why you have made it into a ut which is how you did to those territories you got from portugal you got from france this you took from china so it makes a claim for china to right. say that this is not a normal indian region hmm. so geopolitically it is also advantageous for us to uh, give ladakh people its rights make it a democracy and not just a democracy on paper but an actually democracy that works yeah, a happy democracy you know we have china we have pakistan not very friendly nation true the great thing about india is that it can say our border hmm. 
the people are ours. Huh? Pakistan can't say. They are not happy. There are rebellions all the time on the borders in Ladakh, in Pakistan, you know, the Baltistan area. They are unhappy and want to quit Pakistan. On the Chinese side, the Tibetans do the same. The biggest thing that India can be proud of on these borders are not its tanks, are not its missiles, hmm. are its people who are more India than in New Delhi. Which is exactly why I said that the people of Ladakh are very patriotic. Mm -hmm. When Article 370 was abrogated, we were there in Ladakh. And a lot of people in Ladakh were celebrating. Mm -hmm. They were saying that finally we have our freedom. Finally, we will get what is deserved. Because a lot of times all the funds that were allocated were majorly utilized in Jammu and Kashmir and hardly anything would come to Ladakh. Before 10-15 years ago, people did not even know that Ladakh has a separate identity. These are different people. Is it because that people of Ladakh never made a noise? It was, it is a very silent and calm region. Is patriotism hurting Ladakh? Because we don't make a lot of noise. There is a growing feeling that we are taken for granted. We just cannot bring ourselves to say anything that is not uh, patriotic. And we won't say. Hmm. But that should not hurt, you know? Right. One thing when I went to the Northeast, hmm. they were saying all accords in Northeast happened because of gun. Hmm. Only after an armed conflict, government would make a peace accord. Now, they should show, the current government should show that we are not the kind that get bullied by armed, you know, conflicts only. We listen to peaceful voices and that difference they can make in life. So, a very simple question that what is your current fight? What is your current fast against and what is it for? So, it started last winter when I went on fast for five days. Originally planned to do it on Khardungla top, which is amidst the glaciers of Ladakh, for two reasons. One was for government to change its policies and safeguard Ladakh under the sixth schedule of the constitution. The second was people, people of India and the world, to change their lifestyle. Because of this extravagant lifestyle, the global warming is hurting us because we are the first victims of global warming. Our glaciers are melting away and our lifeline, water, is going away. So my point was, people, please change your lifestyles, live simpler lives. So there's a movement called I Live Simply, hmm. uh, you know, which we started on Mahatma Gandhi's 150th anniversary hmm. five years ago. Then now, the Prime Minister, has launched a beautiful campaign, very similar, called Mission Life. Hmm. I'm a great admirer of that. And I want people of India to follow these you know, and teach the world. This is how we can be Vishwa Gurus, hmm. that we change lifestyles in, in sync with the environment and the world may follow. Right. So these are beautiful things like Mission Life. But at the same time, government... And our leaders should walk the talk hmm. and safeguard fragile ecosystems like Himalayas and Ladakh with whatever policy. I want whole of Himalayas to be safeguarded for tomorrow, not just explored and exploited for today, uh, today's mining lobby, today's industrial lobby. No, we have to think of the future generation. So where there are no policies, make policies for Himachal, for Uttarakhand and so on. Where there are policies, like in Ladakh, the sixth schedule is there. God's sake, you know, fulfill the promises. Similarly, restore democracy. Hmm. Ladakh is one place which has no democracy now. How can India, you know, reconcile with the fact that one of its places that is in such a sensitive area right. is left, uh, yeah, yeah, you have Governor's rule for few months and there is uproar. We have permanent governors. <laughs> so, uh, sometime back I asked you a question that uh, 
people know that they want this the government knows that people want it and the government has promised it then what is the reason that the government is not giving it so you said it's a mystery so right now there are a couple of reasons that are coming to my mind as a observer that first reason could be apathy that it's just not a priority it's something that the government knows that needs to be done but it's not a priority and that's why it's getting neglected the second thing is could be just lack of numbers the biggest problem of a democracy is that unless there is a huge number of people who is coming on the streets and making uh, a demand it just doesn't get the voice that it needs the third thing is patriotism as you said that unless there is an armed conflict the urgency is not just it's just not met to that level so what what do you think will wake up whichever government comes in power to actually listen to the people and fulfill the promises that they have made couldn't be apathy because ladakh is a very strategically sensitive area any disturbance in this area will bring shame to india on the global platform in a disputed region a place that has uh, problems with the government um numbers well however many ladakhis are on 3rd february ladakhi people will be showing the numbers who are for the support of this uh, movement because as i told you um, my take on this mystery is that industrial lobbies with some local leaders who are bought hmm. are giving this impression to the government that people don't want it or it's not needed or it should not be safeguarded so then corruption so, could be a reason so, yes it could very well be you know uh, industrial lobbies with plans of tens of thousands of crores investment in ladakh can easily buy anybody and then these representatives make it feel like people of ladakh are saying this to break this misconception people of ladakh will be gathering in the largest ever numbers in history of ladakh on 3rd february to show their strength and support to this so in this current movement the fast that we are talking about where all the people of ladakh are coming together to put forward their demands how can people like us or regular people who are outside of ladakh support you so in the first week of february most probably i'll be starting a 21 days uh, fast a climate fast arrangement the longest that i'll be doing and it's the longest that gandhi ji did was 21 days and i'm trying to follow the peaceful path and also the length that he did yeah? okay uh, that was against violence against india hmm. by the british this is violence against nature by citizens and government by not safeguarding such fragile ecosystem right so people in india and worldwide um can support us by feeling for our cause and if possible maybe sitting on a one day fast in their own places in groups or individually and sharing that on your social media handles and making us in ladakh feel that we have the whole nation behind us um they can also join us because part of this fast will happen in ladakh for one week and the next two weeks will happen in new delhi okay. at jantar mantar so they can join us make our voice amplified so that the government hears people's voice also and not just industrial lobbies who are asking them to not safeguard ladakh so we need to balance it match it hmm. and um, people can voice it people can write to the prime minister the home minister mm -hmm. and uh, take good care of their own areas and the environment and the air quality okay a lot has been spoken about yeti Mm -hmm. but i feel there is a real yeti in front of us that we can see that we can feel and that is harming our lives 
and that is climate change <laughs> so do you think that you have seen first hand impacts of climate change that are so evident so visible that it is just surprising that people can't act on it yes it its footprints are everywhere <laughs> and yet we are kind of uh, lying flat for it uh, trample us so you can see this in all the glaciers that are now a shadow of themselves hmm you can see it in the flash flood that destroy villages you can see it in the drought that throttle the villages and make people leave as climate refugees abandoning their village hmm. you can see it in winters like this one where it's been hardly cold no? oh. yeah it's not gone beyond minus 10 or so it should be minus 20 minus 25 and no snow it's all brown and actually we are seeing like um, trees that are giving leaves and bud in winter this should not so, happen no it's uh, considered very evil in some way okay uh, bad omen i would okay. say okay so we are seeing such things we are seeing in neighboring kashmir gulmarg all dry and brown hmm we are seeing in new insect pest we there is no word for mosquitoes in ladakh <laughs> there is no word because we don't know mosquitoes now you can see mosquitoes wow all kinds of things are changing and we choose to not act and that's why i say we should do whatever is possible uh, if not any big things then change our personal lives and lifestyle right Do you think it impacts I mean do you think it makes an impact how an individual in a different corner of the world lives his life on endangered areas or let's say sensitive areas like Ladakh does it make a difference because a lot of times people have this mindset that kya farak padta that if they are going to uh, if they are going to save a little bit of water then what big difference is it going to make in the grand scheme of things Do you think our small actions good or bad make any sort of impact on the world as a whole as yes, i mean small things become big no drops make oceans so it's all of us the 7 or 8 billion people who make this planet it's right. each of us that will make the global population so right. everything is interdependent so what we do in chennai will have an impact in ladakh Hmm. definitely it's not even subtle nowadays you know it's a lifestyle that's all carbon intensive and we know beyond doubt now that carbon causes uh, this heating hmm. and who are the first victims us in the mountains so we are like the canary in the coal mine we'll go first and raise this alarm tomorrow it will be your turn so what why do you want to wait isn't it that ladakh becomes that alarm that sacrificial right. uh, valve you said a very interesting thing uh, it's something called as a butterfly effect yeah. that the flutter of a butterfly makes an impact on a tornado as well because the winds that start from a butterfly's flutter may become something that causes a tornado as well so yeah all interrelated when we had come to ladakh we had tasted its apricots and we felt that these apricots are 10 times better than the apricots that we get over here in mumbai one of the reason is that we get apricots from turkey over here and not from ladakh i feel it's so tragic that ladakh is close by ladakh is in india but still for importers or for traders over here it is more difficult to get apricots from ladakh than to get apricots from turkey which is so many kilometers away from india which is outside of india so what is this speciality about ladakh's apricots and how everybody in india should experience it can you tell us truly sad that we not only bring it from such a far away place but also that it is so much less sweet than what you find in india ladakh's apricots in india are now uh, declared the sweetest in the world they are research institute has shown that it has the highest uh, degree of sweetening whatever solubles they are so it is proven that rakte karpo especially one variety is the sweetest all others are so much better than anything you get 
but uh, people i think it's somewhat to do with inertia hmm. you have set routes supply chain routes with turkey so you just do what you do some entrepreneur i'm sure is going to check it out and present to the world or the nation ladakhi apricots and that will be a great hit of an entrepreneur i'm waiting to look at that and uh, yeah for ladakh it will be a game changer it has such vast land and the best uh, climate for the sweetest apricots and india is one of the biggest consumers the apricot market in india is worth many thousand crores ladakh could be your you know, gold mine captive supplier of that and even export so it's just waiting for that um one moment daring entrepreneur yes. to come and change the game amazing okay so do we consume apricots just as apricots or do we make something is there some sort of a value add what do ladakhi people usually do with apricots the sad story again apart from the best of the apricots which people consume the rest are can you imagine given to cows <laughs> and are used in plasters of rooms i have no problems with cows they should get but you use it in you know mud to plaster houses because there is no value for it and meanwhile new delhi imports it from turkey <laughs> so the problem with apricots is that it all falls down at the same time you have like two weeks okay and it has a very low shelf life so we need to develop uh, ways to preserve it dry it and supply it to a captive market that india is rather than draining our foreign reserves on such a fruit that we are the best in the world so this is something that we can definitely be atmanirbhar in exactly and uh, which is something the government should also incentivize and private players should also come in to participate totally right Just a couple of days back I watched this video of yours which was very well produced it was called winters in ladakh where you showed us ladakh in winters you said a very nice line over there that ladakh in the summer is for tourists and ladakh in winters is for travelers and explorers so over there you mentioned a very sad reality that there are so many nice properties in ladakh but they are just lying vacant because there is nobody they have made all sorts of provisions for people to have heating to have all the amenities that they need for their comfort but it is so sad that people don't know about it in fact when i watched that video i made a plan that somehow i have to come to ladakh in winters just to experience this beauty because as you said so many festivals of ladakh happen in winters so can you tell me about this sad reality that this double problem that number 1 people are not knowing about it so they are missing out on an experience and number 2 the hotels have made the provisions these are local people who have uh, yeah. built these hotels so what is this double problem yeah. so it was actually that sad reality which uh, provoked me into making that video i saw that these beautiful hotels have kept their entire envelope hmm. at plus 20 in january which requires a lot of energy i would like them to go solar but till then they may use any fuel but they are keeping it like in new york or london or delhi and yet they had like less than 10% occupancy which is such a waste economically and environmentally so much fuel for nobody so then i wanted to inform the people to come to ladakh and make good use of these facilities no rather than come in summer and add to the crowd and add to the problems come in winter and see what very few get to see right. so that was my mo- main motivation you know this video was done with zero exchange of any money but i promote hotels and homestays by name just so that you know they get clients and clients get an authentic experience and i feel happy that there'll be less of them in summers now that they have come in winter 
and Sonam sir has provided all the contact details of all these different unique hotels as well. And these are not the typical hotels that you would see other uh, other uh, in other places. They are owned by local people over there. They have some sort of a story and each hotel has its own uh, character. So then check them out. Check out this video. You will definitely love it. Every mm. hotel homestay is owned by the people, by the family. So you really get an experience in a family owned hotel hmm. and we would like to keep it that way. Small scale and very comfortable. Our next segment is called Kya Farak Padta where we discuss some things which do make a difference to everybody because you believe and I believe that small actions do stack up and become something bigger. Mm -hmm. So my first question to you is tourism se Ladakh ko kya farak padta? अगर इनसेंसिटिव टूरिस्ट आए तो बर्बाद होता है अगर सेंसिटिव सपोर्टिव टूरिस्ट होते हैं तो आबाद होता है ये फर्क सस्टेनेबल डेवलपमेंट से दुनिया को क्या फर्क पड़ता सर्वाइवल ये फर्क की बात नहीं है जीने मरने की है जिंदगी और मौत की है विल बी एक्सटिंग एज ए चीज इवन तो लाइफ एंड डेथ का फर्क अच्छे एजुकेशन से भारत को क्या फर्क पड़ता है Again, a nation is as uh, great and glorious as its citizen. Hmm. So well-educated people with wisdom will make a Vishwaguru of Bharat and ill-educated, unemployed people will make it a, a deplorable nation that nobody respects. Okay, so it has been a very interesting conversation. I really loved it and I think it was long overdue. We, I mean, we admire you since a really long time, but then we got in touch about four or five years ago. Mm -hmm. And since then we wanted to meet you. We wanted to have this conversation and it's finally happened. So it was very exciting for me, but everything good also has to come to an end. So this conversation has to come to an end. So what is the last message that you would like to give to all the audience? Thank you. I thoroughly enjoyed. So. Three things that people can do to help uh, Ladakh, not only Ladakh, but the planet as Vasudeva Kutumbakam out. One thing is that, again, please live simply in the big cities so that we in the mountains simply live. Hmm. Simplify your lifestyles, as the Prime Minister calls it, the lifestyle for environment. So we must support every initiative that makes our nation and the planet more sustainable. Okay. Secondly, if you are talking about uh, Ladakh itself, then I would say when you visit Ladakh, be sensitive, think of the consequences of your actions and wherever possible, and it is always possible, visit Ladakh not in the crowded times when you waste your money, you don't get to see Ladakh, Visit in other seasons, winter, spring, autumn, and visit the rest of Ladakh, not just. So as visitors, we can do a lot. Farak <laughs> padta hai. And thirdly, I don't have just three messages. I have many to make India a great nation. Sare jahan se achcha hindustha banane ke liye bahut kuch hai dil mein. But as I told you, the cause of the China campaign my channel has been suppressed and I would like you all to support it and visit it and uh, write to whoever needed to not use social media this game of business. Let's support good content. There will be all the links, all the relevant links about all the videos that we discussed in this particular conversation in the description. Do check out Sonam sir's channel and don't just check it out. Be a regular viewer of it as well because the one thing that we absolutely love about Sonam sir is that he always focuses on the solutions. He will never just pose a problem. He will go in depth and come up with a solution if the solution does not exist. So that's something really interesting and that's something that the world needs. That's something that India desperately needs. So thank you so much Sonam sir for having this conversation and see you in the next episode. Thank you. Hey friends, thank you so much for tuning in into this experiment of recording a podcast. I was really excited to record this podcast. 
but I want to know from you. Who would you like to see next on this podcast? Tell us in the comments below. If you have any feedback for us, email it to us on this email ID. We will surely incorporate it. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe because aapke support se hume farak padata.